My name is Shin, a faculty member at Rady School at UC San Diego. And also I'm a faculty director for the Institute for Supply Chain Excellence and Innovation at Rady School. This is the inaugural North American Business Opportunities Symposium webinar series. And in this webinar, we'll focus on the topic of post-pandemic realignment of value change in Mexico and the cross-border regions. First of all, I hope the everyone is safe and well under this pandemic. COVID-19 has been quite a challenge, but at the same time, we know that big challenge always comes with big opportunities. So in the past few decades, starting from 1990s, the supply chain industry, we have seen growing trend of globalization. However, starting from 2010s, we also noticed a different movement. We did a project last quarter for this post-globalization movement, and in particular, Due to geopolitics and trade policy changes, some companies have been rebalancing their supply chains from China to different places in the globe. Many companies identified Mexico as a potential candidate of the globalization, regionalization of the global supply chains. In addition, the pandemic accelerated this trend of regionalization, which is a great opportunity for this region. This is the perfect timing to study this topic of cross-border supply chains and regional development. However, there is also an urgency of leveraging this opportunity to grow further. That is why we believe that building up this community is important. I hope that this symposium will serve as a stepping stone to build this community further. So as a first thing for this symposium, Rady School Associate Dean Ann Amil will give a welcoming remark. Exciting to see so many impressive people get together and uh, talk about important topics. I'm not gonna take a lot of your time but just a little bit, give you a little bit of background about the Rady School of Management and uh, where we are. So the Rady School of Management is, is about 16 years old, which is fairly young for an academic institution, uh, built in a fairly young university, which is UC San Diego, which has, has done impressive things in its uh, 60, uh, 61st year now. So the Rady School of Management was formed because the business community here uh, got tired of losing talent to uh, places that had good business schools. So they would, they would raise talent and send them to uh, get a business degree, say in the Northeast, and people would stay there because the opportunities around there were, were exciting and the schools are connected to the community. And so our community wanted a good business school and they came to UC San Diego and said, let's start one. And that's fairly unique. It's a school formed by the community. And so far in 16 years, uh, I think we've managed to do impressive things. One of the things that set, uh, the, sets the Rady School of Business apart is our belief and our actions around learning by doing. So in all our programs, starting from the MBA program, where we have a lab to market series, which both takes new ideas and new ventures and, and tries to bring them to market, and also works with companies on innovative consulting uh, in, uh, and entrepreneurial projects so that uh, students get hands-on experience, they graduate less green, and companies get the benefit of the business school being here to help um, their efforts. We then developed more programs like the Master of uh, Finance or the Master of Science in Business Analytics or recently the Master of Professional Accountancy. All of those programs, which are one-year masters, also have um, a required capstone, which means students go and do projects with companies. So take, for example, the Master of Science Business Analytics, they could take an interesting challenge you might have around supply chain data in your company and help you come up with algorithms and processes to, uh, to better use that data. And one of the things that we're looking at now, which is sort of very exciting, is the intersection between supply chain and analytics, where we have the, uh, the, the ability to kind of be um, front runners. So just an example, the Massive Science Business Analytics is um, entering its fourth year and it's already ranked 10th in the nation in uh, business analytics and, and, and climbing. So there's a lot of exciting opportunities. We can't wait for you to uh, come to campus for, you know, for following uh, follow up meetings, get to know the school and collaborate uh, in any way possible. We believe in a lot of win win collaborations. And, and that's as I said, the primary reason we exist. So this looks like a super exciting uh, meeting and I can't wait to hear what everyone has to say. Uh, so uh, enjoy, 
make the most of it. And thank you so much for Shin for organizing this and making this possible. Let's go to our first keynote speaker, Mary Warshak. Mary is the Dean of University Extension and Associate Vice Chancellor of Public Programs at UC San Diego. Mary. Good morning. And I thank my colleagues in the Rady School for this opportunity. I've actually been at UCSD nearly 50 years. And I think that's why Shin asked me to speak because the history of the university and the history of the cross-border region are inextricably connected. Uh, as many of you, you're much younger than I, but as many of you know from an historical point of view, Tijuana was the cul-de-sac of Mexico and San Diego was the cul-de-sac of the United States back in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. And oh, how the world has changed. And oh, how ready institutions like Rady, but also CETIS and Tijuana and UNAM are poised and ready to be partners in this next iteration of our cross-border linkages. I just want to reiterate what Shin said, that there's a global context for what's going on today. And that is, I like to use TED Talk bullets. So I'm going to suggest to the three of you, or uh, three ideas to all of you that I think are important to remember. We really globally are moving from the concept of offshoring to nearshoring and onshoring. And the San Diego Tijuana region represents the latter two. In fact, a book has just come out called El Tercer País, The Third Country, suggesting that the border of Mexico and the border of California, Arizona, Texas, <clears throat> and New Mexico is really a third country, a zone where all kinds of things happen that could not happen independently on the US side or independently on the Mexican side. I spend a lot of time in Sweden and I'm conscious of how important the Baltic nations are to the competitiveness of the advanced technology and research in Scandinavia. And we all know about Hong Kong and modern China. I think what we're here today to acknowledge is that San Diego region and Baja California are moving into this family of cross-border synergistic uh, economic drivers. Shin asked me to give you a, just a little bit of history. And I have to remind everyone on the screen, until the middle of the 19th century, we belonged to Mexico. And uh, this was primarily an agricultural and ranching area. California wasn't even a state at the time, San Diego, was barely a, a township, village, city. But with the Mexican-American War of 1848, all of that changed. So a region which for over 200 years had been one vast expanse, suddenly had a legal border. And that border said, San Diego, you're in the United States. Tijuana, you're in Mexico. And it's that border we've been dealing with for more than 150 years. And it is that border, as Shin suggests, which is in a sense disappearing and creating all kinds of opportunities for new economic synergies as we move into what the UCLA forecasting project calls the roaring 20s. I guess they're optimists at UCLA. Um, there is uh, an increasing amount of synergy and integration in this border region. During Prohibition, during World War I, during World War II, there were not so attractive synergies between the two regions. And yet Tijuana grew with the restaurant business, the hospitality business and early forms of manufacturing which really began to take hold 
in the 60s, 70s, and especially with the end of the Cold War, with NAFTA, with a series of developments, both in Mexico and the United States, that were extremely important. And I want to point out to Shin, because I think history is important. On the 250th anniversary of the birth of the United States, 1976, a very active group of Tijuana and San Diego leaders came together to celebrate 400 years of San Diego Tijuana history in a program called Las Fronteras. And I uh, think that this was the beginning of a new cultural synergy, not just an economic opportunity in the cross-border region. And it is covered in this new book for those of you who are interested in it. It was a year long series of dialogues on our shared ecology, our shared economies, our shared history, but also focusing on the future and the opportunity ahead. And with the end of the Cold War and with NAFTA, it exploded. And suddenly you saw a proliferation of cross-border civic organizations. There were a few professors here and there at San Diego State and at UCSD that were interested in the border, but it was not a core intellectual interest the way it's becoming today in Rady at US Mexico Studies Center within our School of Engineering where we actually partner on degree programs now. And so this transformation in the 80s and the 90s led by Las Fronteras and then an organization called San Diego Dialogue is very, very important for us to remember. One of the most important things that came out of a early research covered in the LA Times and, I, and actually we were invited to make a, a presentation at the Washington Press Club was research on who crosses the border which occurred in the late 19, uh, 1980s. And what we discovered is $2 billion in retail trade in San Diego from border crosses, as well as crossers in to uh, Tijuana to shop, medical services, the labor force. We began to realize as of the 1990s, we're a family we're uh, an integrated region and there are opportunities moving forward. So if I were to fast forward to now, Shin, and the roaring 20s that lie ahead, I'd like to conclude with four ideas that I think are important in framing the conversations for the remainder of the morning. The first is based on this uh, three minute history of the border region, what I want to share with you is the technologies, the R&D, and the manufacturing on both sides of the border are mature and globally competitive. And I'm sure Flavio will share. They're business incubators. There are uh, uh, more engineering students graduating from UNAM and CETES than from UCSD and SDSU. Therma Fisher in San Diego employs hundreds of engineers trained in Mexico. So we are complementary and equal to the task in terms of R&D and manufacturing. Of course, our long suit is R&D, Mexico's is manufacturing. In that regard, Shin, thank you for mentioning downtown. UCSD is downtown because there's over $2 billion about to be invested in new technology, business, life science, manufacturing, office space downtown. And so there is much to suggest that there is going to be a new innovation hub in the region and one that is much closer and more accessible to our friends in Tijuana, and across Baja California than we have been in the past, in part, in large part, because of the trolley. Number two, I alluded to it, the talent pool on both sides of the border 
is unparalleled. We're not talking about semi-skilled, uneducated labor force. Increasingly, manufacturing is led by well-trained engineers and technical talent with know-how, just as our R&D infrastructure is fed by well-trained, well-educated. My third point, and again, in talking about what's happening downtown, there's external investment occurring both in Tijuana and in San Diego. So the array of global companies that are resident in Baja California, the numbers of nonstop flights to Asia out of Rodriguez Field are greater than out of Lindbergh Field. It's an indicator that something's going on and that this global supply, supply chain that Shin is focusing on is happening here and can continue to grow here. And fourth, as a sociologist, I have to talk about culture and social dynamics. I've emphasized in my first three points, the capacity. The capacity in terms of know-how, infrastructure, the backbone to build on. We're shovel ready, Shin, as they used to say in the Obama administration. But I want to suggest three other dimensions of this cultural social dynamics. One is that we've built since the 1970s, really, and I would place it at around 1976. So it's nearly more than 40 years. Uh, a real record of achievement and growth. San Diego has fabulous metrics. Look at how UCSD has risen internationally, but also look at how San Diego has become a global hub of R&D, respected around the world, as has the border, Tijuana, Mexicali, become a global hub of manufacturing around the world. We have the record. We show we can grow, we can change, we can adapt. My third point, and perhaps the most uh, important one under this notion of culture and social dynamics, is trust. I'm looking at this screen, and I know Eugenio, and I know Flavio, and I know Shin, and I know, and you all, we all sort of know one another, <laughs> or at least we work with people who know and trust one another in the same time zone sharing similar cultural values, sharing an entrepreneurial culture. And that's why we are positioned to be very effective. And finally, and that's what the rest of the morning is about, opportunity. The opportunity is here. And what the team at the Rady School is doing is fabulous research to identify where those opportunities lie and the paths to achieving them, which is the point of today's conference, to get us in the mode of thinking about opportunity, thinking about how to better understand it, thinking about how to grow it and leverage it for the future. So I'm just a local yokel. I'm a bit of a booster for the cross-border region, but I did want to share my enthusiasm and, and, and hope that the remainder of the morning is a really productive one because the opportunity is there for sure. Great, thank you so much, Mary. Thank you so much. Um, really, I'm looking forward to the day that we can also share your enthusiasm, everyone else's enthusiasm in person. Okay. So before moving on to Flavio, um, we will have one quick poll. So um, Talia, can you open up the poll? So please, um, we will give you a few minutes to finish this poll. Um, and uh, we will, while you're doing it, we'll move on to uh, Flavio's talk. Flavio has close to now three decades of uh, career experience in um, regional economic development and currently is a graduate research fellow at the Center for US-Mexico Studies in UC San Diego. With that, Flavio. 
Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Dr. Shane, uh, for this invitation and the opportunity to share with you some ideas uh, related to you know, how uh, are we as a region, um, not just uh, locally here in, in the San Diego, Tijuana region, but as Mexico, US and Mexico, North America, will be able to take advantage of the opportunities uh, in this global change in value chains and, and the shift in how we're producing things. Um, I do have a presentation that I would like to share with you. I was introduced, uh, my name is Flavio Olivieri and I am a uh, professional industrial engineer and a professional of economic development in the Baja California and San Diego region or Southern California region, a Cali Baja promoter uh, in about almost 30 years. That, had be, that has been the focus of my career is to promote this region uh, in attracting investment and, uh, and creating entrepreneurial uh, ecosystems uh, that collaborate across the border in different topics, uh, not just manufacturing, but other, other areas like information technology and also healthcare systems, uh, you know, medical tourism, uh, senior care and other areas. So with that experience and, and, and that um, passion for promoting the region, I just wanna share with you these ideas. Um, so you know, we know that um, companies and uh, value chains or um, whole industries, they continuously look for ways to be more competitive. And uh, one of the biggest trends uh, in this pursuit for competitiveness has been looking for more comparative cost advantages around the world. And uh, as global trade had been you know, open, opening up around the world with free trade agreements and the world uh, you know, with GATT and then the World uh, uh, Organization on, on, on Commerce and Trade, um, up to 50% of all trade around the world is involved in supply chain uh, or value chains, uh, international value chains. And close to 20 or more percent of that is concentrated in China. So this is kind of the, the result of this process that started in mid 70s, you know, and was propelled during the 90s and uh, early 2000s. But around uh, you know, 2010, um, with the recession, even previous than that, um, things started to change uh, you know, or level off or inclusive um, started to rebalance again. And one of the biggest shifts, uh, of course, was the increase in the cost of manufacturing in China. So that pursuit for cost advantage um, started to shift you know, around uh, 2010 or even earlier um, than that. And of course, propelled by the global recession. Now, this, uh, from that, companies and uh, businesses shifting towards um, not just uh, cost advantages, but more having competitive, to be competitive in terms of um, meeting the needs of their customers have looked to be become more resilient and better uh, at adapting to the changing environment in, their mar in the needs of their market, in the demand. Um, so some of those, some of the challenges that have been present uh, all, all this time, and we start to see some impacts of uh, major changes or uh, uh, circumstances like uh, the pandemic. You know, we, we see that natural disasters, um, and I would include there this uh, health um, situation, geopolitical uh, shifts, you know, changes in, in trade policy, um, you know, tariffs on trade. Um, so this nationalization or nationalism uh, that is, has uh, increased in, in recent history. And of course, technology, you know, uh, the shift uh, towards more automated processes, the automation and all of the technologies that converge within the concept of industry 4.0. All of these are factors that make, can make those supply chains uh, you know, become more, more competitive and more resilient. So this shift from just cost advantage to resiliency you know, is changing the environment of the global supply chain. And that's where um, we start to think about, well, what is uh, the, the right combination between you know, global 
uh, distributed production sharing uh, uh, schemes or systems to well, how we can you know be able to serve the market faster so speed to market becoming a more important factor of course we continue to focus on cost and comparative advantages but is it be, that becomes uh, part of the formula and not necessarily so total cost uh, of ownership or total cost of landed product in the market uh, so everything that contributes from r d uh, and this and post sales service and all these other factors that actually contribute to the total cost or the total ownership of a value chain are then factors that become uh, more important and uh, we start to evaluate different different options so we can get to a right shoring no so it's offshoring near shoring um, uh, or uh, insuring but the right shoring so we, we, we have a, a way of understanding how we can better leverage the different uh, opportunities that are available for us so in the, in that regard you know as mary was mentioning right so the mexico the us mexico north american region has a lot of opportunities and at the border regions is like tijuana and san diego um, this or baja california and san diego region have a unique uh, opportunity to become leaders in this uh, potential reset you know so the pandemic has um, really accelerated this process of of, of rethinking and of, uh, and reevaluating how we can become more competitive so the scenarios are you know positive in terms of uh, recovery or maybe not as positive or you know, optimistic of recovery and it depends a lot in terms of what we do and how we think about uh, this reset. So beyond the cost advantages, uh, USMCA, North America, and the combination or the complementary capabilities of uh, US Mexico um, really stand out as an opportunity to, to increase uh, competitiveness. And uh, some of the main things that um, uh, was quickly mentioned, but uh, are the elements that are available to us, of course, is the framework of the USMCA, but also the experience that already exists in North America in this value chain. So we've been doing this for a long time, and there's a lot of talent and there's a lot of infrastructure that is put in place already, and it may need to improve, and we could do that, and, and we will do that, um, but there's already a base of uh, of experience in, in uh, just uh, not just the manufacturing part of it, the technological part, but also in these relationships and in creating the channels of communication and uh, just the uh, policies and being able to follow uh, regulations and being able to comply with uh, different trade uh, specifications. So all of that experience is available. Finally, uh, just uh, kind of bring, bringing it down to our region, to the what we call the Calibaja uh, binational mega region. You know, we we've institutionalized uh, a lot of the relationship, and there's so many different channels of communication and collaboration that we've established in the in the last you know ten years or or, or even more so. Um, but we we basically are a region that um, can foster. Uh, the a complete value chains uh, from R&D to manufacturing and post sale uh, service with our complementary capabilities. And, and by itself, we're, we're a region that has a potential market you know, as a startup. Um, and we have already this experience, you know, almost 50 years of trade in manufacturing. And uh, we have uh, at least within our region, an intra-region trade of six billion dollars, but our external, you know, our exports as a region, you know, exceed that, you know, by far. So there's a lot of opportunity in terms of the supply chain that could be developed in this region, and, and you know, it's not uh, for all sectors in uh, you know all of the region, all of the different types of manufacturing, but we do have some specific capabilities that are already in place in, in electronics, medical devices. Uh, automotive uh, parts, autom automobile industry in general, and aerospace. So those are some of the industries that uh, have evolved more competitively. And uh, we see uh, that this shift of uh, this reshoring shift uh, 
maybe not necessarily number of companies, but we do see an expansion. Uh, you know, this is an example of what's going on in Tijuana, uh, how the manufacturing industry or EMEX industry uh, increased uh, significantly in terms of uh, employment this year, even with all of uh, the situation with the, the pandemic. And especially in the medical devices sector, uh, there's a significant increase in terms of uh, expansion of production and of existing companies and, uh, and some new companies as well. But mostly is through the expansion of existing operations. And, uh, and we see that in, in the demand for industrial space as well, uh, not just in employment. You know, there there's, has been a significant increase in terms of industrial um, in, uh, space or real estate. And uh, there's, there's a waiting list you know, for, for that type of building. And uh, there, there's just a lot of demand that continues to grow. So this is just a, an example or, or a manifestation of this, this shift. And uh, very importantly, you know, so how do we do this? You know, and there's many ways to do it, and uh, companies have been doing it in mostly a standalone fashion, uh, having their own, you know, value chains uh, uh, through the EMEX program. This. Uh, a scheme, you know, fiscal scheme, uh, but there's other formulas like the shelter companies. So shelter companies are service providers of manufacturing services, and uh, they put together everything that a company needs in order to operate a manufacturing process. But also we see a growing capacity in contract manufacturing. This is not just in Baja California, but nationwide in Mexico, we see a lot more um, of uh, contract manufacturers that have capabilities that are open for business. Uh, and so they're not just here as a part of a value chain, but they actually have operations in Mexico that offer uh, even from um, engineering uh, services, like uh, you know, we'll have the participation in the workshops today of a company from Japan that established in Tijuana and they have uh, engineering capabilities as well. So they can do design and engineering and do the manufacturing in, in the electronic sector. But also there's an opportunity uh, to be in a more collaborative environment you know, or business model. So merge and acquisitions, uh, joint ventures, um, you know, we've, uh, as uh, Mexican business has been growing and there's been a continuous um, area of joint ventures between Mexican companies and foreign companies to increase their capabilities, to do technology transfer, to do uh, more capacity building in Mexico. So that is definitely a business model that will be uh, a way to you know, quickly um, gain the, came the capabilities and also to be able to, um, to be more more competitive in terms of the culture of the region and better use of the resources. Um, so with that closing, uh, you know, what are this workshop, this uh, panel or event is really to establish a, an agenda, an agenda for, for research and collaboration, uh, for program development that will create a community that, that will develop the tools or, you know, uh, the support for uh, creating this supply chain and making this supply chain more competitive within North America. Um, so there's significant opportunities, mostly in advanced manufacturing uh, industries or that require advanced manufacturing processes like aerospace, automotive industry, and uh, medical devices and, and those areas um, that are already have infrastructure. And of course, there, there's already the professional and the engineering capabilities uh, in, in the region. And uh, not just... Uh, in terms of low cost, uh, you know, labor intensive processes, but actually in higher value added processes, you know, and in, in co-creation. So to, to quote, as uh, Mary was saying, you know, there's capabilities on both sides in terms of from the engineering and manufacturing. And uh, there's there's an opportunity there to leverage those resources, not just in, in the low uh, cost uh, labor. So software, of course, is one of that um, and process innovation to be more competitive in terms of our, uh, the design of our processes. Um, we can take advantage of the trade and logistics uh, and the new schemes within the, the USMCA and uh, to have more 
flexibility, you know, business models or value chains that are more flexible that can adjust quicker to the market because of the proximity, because of the experience and those uh, relationships that already exist. So mass customization, uh, you know, e-commerce, uh, the boom of e-commerce has created a, a different type of, uh, of uh, demand from customers. So there's more expectation of um, you know, real time, uh, very quick response to the needs and doing being able to do mass products and take them to market quickly. So the proximity and new logistics capabilities will enable to do that. Um, there's industries like refurbishing or remanufacturing of products. So thinking about also the environmental issues in the long run. Uh, how do we, you know, uh, do things that we can be uh, more environmentally friendly into the future? And of course, uh, voluminous products. You know, things that are very large that require, um, you know, so where transportation is a factor. So those are all areas of opportunity. But also, we have some challenges that we need to focus on. So the supplier base downstream. Um, you know, we might have to invest in developing that. Um, that's where the joint ventures uh, could be a, a good opportunity to do uh, the downstream you know, supplier base. But also uh, we do have the talent, but maybe it's not uh, ready to go as we would like. So talent readiness programs, we need to focus on how do we how do we get the base talent? You know, there's a lot of engineering students on both sides of the border. Um, how do we get them to a point where they're ready to go? And um, we do. We also have to, you know, uh, standardize and uh, become even more harmonized in terms of our business culture. There's infrastructure projects that we need to complete. Government policies, you know, the high-level economic dialogue. We should restart that process again. We should focus on, on like uh, reestablishing something similar to the mosaic. Uh, um, structure that we had before uh, the, the that program went away. Um, and there's some issues, you know, in of public safety, uh, uh, industry 4.0 adoption and environmental impacts. So all of those are some of the challenges and the things that we need to discuss and you know, establish this research agenda. Uh, so with that, I thank you. And, uh, you know, that's my email. Uh, if anybody would like to ha send me any questions. Uh, and uh, I wish uh, a lot of success in the workshops that we come to that to establish that agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Flavio. I would also like to add, uh, Eduardo made a comment saying, with the advantages Flavio is presenting, he would also like to add productivity, right? I can't agree more. In addition, I would also like to add um, one of the uh, advisory board members for the Institute for Supply Chain Excellence and, Excellence and Innovation, Tom Linton used to say, it's all about time, right? So um, I will add with the most sort of a, with the manufacturing as well as a collaboration with, with Mexico, it brings the speed and it brings the agility. With that shorter supply chain, it comes with the big advantage of reducing time, right? That's what I see in terms of the future. Um, and also in, for the um, poll result, the first poll, the result was actually about 70% of our industry uh, participants were saying they are expecting regionalization or localization and about 30% were saying uh, status quo. Now here comes the second uh, poll. And while you are doing poll, let me introduce um, Eugenio Marin. Eugenio is a CEO of FUMEC, which is US-Mexico Foundation for Science. And with that, Eugenio. First and foremost, I would like to thank the University of California, Dr. Shin, of course, and his amazing team for uh, working on this strategy together and the kind invitation today. Since I just have a few minutes, uh, let me get into it. So just for further reference, who we are, uh, the US-Mexico Foundation for Science or FUMEC is a nonprofit organization created along with NAFTA in 1992, supported by organizations in both countries. Our mission uh, is to design, promote, articulate, and operate high impact programs that push the development of value ecosystems for regions and sectors of mutual interest. And our mandate entitles cooperation in science and technology uh, in order to contribute to the, the, the reduction of economic asymmetries uh, between Mexico and the United States. And it has evolved over time into a series of programs uh, to support SMEs, which are equipped with technological tools that allow them 
to insert themselves into global value chains. Nowadays, uh, FUMEC works with companies uh, in diverse sectors like agri-food, aerospace and automotive manufacturing, health, software, industry 4.0, among others. We have served over 5,000 SMEs, 1,000 entrepreneurs and 1,300 small producers in Mexico. And we collaborate with over 200 universities, institutes and organizations promoting economic development. Our capital allocation through our value added programs account for more than 100 million of dollars of public and private resources. Now, there are so many expert opinions uh, out there and certainly we just got very relevant statistics from Flavio and a very interesting historic framework from Madam Walshock. Uh, so I thought uh, this pragmatic 10 business trends from the economies would help us convey a fast forward uh, immersion into the post pandemic realignment of value chains. Bad debts will be up, Chinese banks non-performing assets approach 500 billion this year, up 50% 50, uh, 50 from 2019. Governments encourage infrastructure spending, global spending will be up uh, around 8%. 8 in the infrastructure spending will be up 18%. Electric vehicles will sell 3.4 million units up from 2.1 in 2019. And international tourist arrivals will be up um, 8%, but 15% uh, below 2019 as well. Plane makers, Boeing and Airbus will build around 60% of normal quantity this year, although the aviation recovery will come probably three, four uh, years down the road. So oil, oil prices will be $45 per barrel and probably yet another $10 could go off if lockdown persists. Ad spending will grow by 6% up to 573 billion. The price of gold will be flat. Box office revenue surge by 78%, but will be down 38% versus 2019. Retail bankruptcies will accumulate as well. So following these trends, um, now look at the perception from the World Bank about the performance of these 15 sectors on their rain, fair and sunny scenarios. Most of them, as you see here, are facing complex comebacks like the manufacturing related ones, automotive, aerospace and defense, energy, etc. Although in Mexico, for instance, the auto sector is gaining new traction through opportunities at reorganizing supply chains around the electric and hybrid platforms of several uh, automakers. Sectors like IT, telecom, healthcare, and food are growing and gaining a position to move into better value streams. But this for sure should not make us cry a river. And this is important. For Mexico, um, well, sorry, uh, if, uh, then it's, if, if, if a business must survive, the leader must move it from innovation to transformation. I want you to think about these three questions that become very relevant. Where should we make our products? How will customers want to buy our products and services? And, how, um, and if, have we considered migration or diversification to different sectors with different business dynamics? So just take a couple of seconds to think about those. For over a decade uh, in FUMEC, uh, we have helped strengthening some of these value chains. In 2004, we created the Technology Business Accelerator Program with the support of the Minister of Economy of Mexico and with the purpose of helping technology-based companies to bring their innovative technology products and services into global markets. What you see here in a snapshot is an example of a complex process we follow to support SMEs from different manufacturing backgrounds to migrate or diversify to the aerospace sector. This time frame usually takes between three to five years for a company to succeed and get valuable contracts and ultimately long-term agreements. Although recently we have been able to compress it a little bit, uh, taking us in some cases from two to three years to get first results and integrate them successfully. So what we do is what we navigate through these uh, different milestones you see here, combining comprehensive uh, industry knowledge with world-class business experience 
to provide a deep understanding of the industry, which combined with the development of strategic planning skills, we support business growth and economic expansion through the main aerospace groups in the world. A fundamental component is the collaboration with federal, states, uh, federal and local governments, state and local governments, as well as agencies and other strategic associations in Mexico. Then our global team includes former C executives, uh, C level executives and retired entrepreneurs, as well as world class industry support organizations and project managers who offer uh, intensive follow up on opportunities of our beneficiary companies. The Tech Virus Space program uh, has successfully supported more than 200 Mexican SMEs, which 100 out of those have been integrated into national and international airspace supply chains, diversifying their impact on this sector, uh, helping them understand the dynamics of its different niche markets, work around their business models focused on growth adjusting their cost structures, redesigning their organizations in order to compete in an industry that is constantly changing and evolving. Uh, that led us to generate important success stories in this industry and where more than 50% uh, of those uh, of, of that group have managed to establish uh, annual and continuous direct and indirect export operations with a value of more than $80 million. So for Mexico, the implementation of Industry 4.0 is a priority issue, not only because economic inertia is directed there, as Flavio pointed, but also because of the, commit the commitments that Mexico has with global markets and its role as an export bridge in the different manufacturing value chains. From previous um, analysis, we understood that manufacturing is one of the most important sectors for data generation across product life cycle on top of uh, on top of sectors like government banking or communications that alone provides us with a great source of valuable information to build upon smart dashboards implementing feedback and control for its complex systems but most importantly fitting capabilities for ai to help us avoid sunk costs and reduce uh, reduce uh, production time cycles Mind you, the, the USMCA makes reshoring or relocation of manufacturing to North America a very attractive option for many companies. However, companies are often in an awkward position. They cannot identify available suppliers in the country that can supply parts and raw materials of the desired quality uh, or in the required quantity at the desired uh, cost level to maintain their global competitiveness. So this, along with the lack of technical knowledge uh, in the workforce, uh, has been the main barriers for foreign manufacturers to establish operations in the United States. So then it looks like having a manufacturing Marshall Plan, like the one proposed by the Association for Manufacturing Excellence, doesn't sound too far away, right? Now, the U.S. has tariffs on 66% of Chinese, ex, uh, Chinese imports. Certainly, that won't go away. And just take a look on some initiatives like North America First and the Reshoring Initiative that fundamentally have worked success uh, reshoring business cases in the last 10 years and have drilled down uh, its complexities to bring this into fruition. Consider that there are most, uh, sorry, there are more than 200 billion of Chinese and Asian imports in the US on a yearly basis. And some of the best suited products to provoke viable reshoring uh, opportunities are listed here, like computers and electronics, military equipment, appliances, uh, metal fabrication, rubber and plastic products, transportation goods like aerospace and automotive components, molds, dyes, and tooling and pharmaceutical and medical devices, as well as um, the, some others that Flavio mentioned before. So we'll know that the devil is in the details and the what's are fairly clear. Push comes to shove when we start asking ourselves about the house. Uh, well, there are many different organizations uh, like the ones you see on the right of the slide 
uh, working very hard on providing some answers and piloting programs to overcome the difficulties. Uh, some pointers on, on this direction are uh, some of this. Analysis on, of product components, origin, and it's uh, the, the alternate of availability. Uh, identification of high-risk components uh, based on ge geographic, geographical, uh, geographical, geographical origin. Uh, analysis of reshoring characteristics for high-risk components. Uh, analysis of reshoring costs based on digital twin approach and creating a digital twin of supply chain, end-to-end -end supply chain modeling. And some others are digital twin reverse engineering, systems engineering, product modeling and behavior simulation, manufacturing modeling and simulation, uh, testing and validation, pre-qualifying a network of SME suppliers and organizing and managing sourcing events and oversee a startup operations and first article inspection. So these are just some of, of, of some of these uh, interesting pointers that some of these organizations have put together and are working very, very hard on them to really um, have a, a, a better, better prepared supply base. Here, I just want to share with you uh, the partial measurement we've done in our programs analyzing its impact on some North, North American uh, manufacturing supply chains like agri-food, aerospace and automotive. And this account uh, for a global annual integration of over $285 million and in providing us with a real evidence that empowering ecosystems with the right support or the right, uh, uh, the right reshoring as Flavio, as Flavio stated before, um, we can really uh, support and access and, and get incremental results. Sometimes we will find companies willing to take on moonshots and some of them will hit the jackpot in terms of exp exponential growth. Others will grow more steadily, but we need all of them playing their roles on the supply chain and continue helping them to succeed. So in summary, we have learned that we're facing times of opportunity. If we focus on seamless collaboration, that could bring into life a competitive world manufacturing hub uh, referred as a cross-border region between Mexico and the US. But how we do this? Well, we need to consider talent pools in the specific regions, fostering education, moving manufacturing towards a more integrated digital economy, working reshoring business models with the total cost of ownership, leading the decision-making process, understanding well the framework to operate uh, within the USMCA and supporting small manufacturers to comply with industry standards, getting fast track know-how, access to low interest rate capital and get them ready to integrate into global value chains. Well, not as easy as it sounds for sure, uh, but I am convinced that definitely this is the way, as the Mandalorian would say. So thank you very much for, for the time. And I think that this is going to be very beneficial to all the group today uh, in this, in this uh, symposium. Thank you very much.